Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 876. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 19th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could be here. This is our happy place, as I've talked before. There's nothing that delights me more than talking to George on his webcam, drinking my coffee, and talking about the politics and the news and uh, the church of the, of the day, and it's a lot of fun. George is a smart, resourceful historian of the church and uh, been a great friend for many years. And I'm glad you guys get to participate in it. You get to see um, what conversations are like here, and it's a lot of fun. Before we get too far into this, this is a great chance for you to like us. So it looks just like this on Facebook and YouTube. Click that button and you've given us free advertising. You fool the uh, uh, algorithms on Facebook and YouTube to think that this is a really, really, really good show. Please share this episode with friends, family, and foe. And for the love of God, go to the comment section. It, when we're done talking, everything seems to really blow up in the comment sections. Uh, and again, this week it has done the same. We really appreciate all the comments. We don't have time to reply to all of them because we both have full-time lives outside of this show. But we really appreciate you, the viewer, for all you do for us. It's been great, and do keep us in your prayers. George... That was a quick intro for two minutes. How are you doing this week? Pretty good. My daughter, Laura, has moved from her hospital job in San Francisco mm-hmm. all the way across country to Vermont. And so she starts working today in the woods of Vermont at a psychiatric hospital. Uh, I think it's because she wants to be able to buy Bernie Sanders stickers uh, and stick them on her van. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's it telling me? My daughter's going from San Francisco to Vermont. I don't know what the next stop will be on this journey. Uh, uh, my kids. Greenwich are of Village, a, who knows? Yeah, uh, my children and your children are of a different political persuasion than us. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not surprised to, to find children under uh, 35 finding very populist uh, socialists to, uh, to love in, in politics. I don't get it. I have a b- bigger understanding of history and uh, communism and stuff like that, but uh, we shall see, George. Uh, we are here in Maryland for uh, a little while. We parked out here in the middle of Southern Maryland, and uh, Southern Maryland is a mini uh, Florida peninsula. Uh, in Florida, when we were in the middle of Central Florida, we were 90 minutes from the beach on, uh, beach on the East Coast and 90 minutes from a beach on the west coast here you're 30 minutes from a beach either way so as just beaches were okay george let's move on to the show lots to talk about here um lots of strange news first story is going to be a free church of england story um where our friend of the program reverend brent murphy has been fired big sex scandal no stealing money from the church no uh Being a great YouTuber? Maybe. I don't know. We have to figure this out. Uh, And we need to talk a little bit about the Free Church of England, which we always thought was a healthy alternative to the Church of England. There's more to be talked about there. Tell me about Brett, George. Well, about a little over two weeks ago, we learned that uh, Brett Murphy, Brett Murphy told us he had been told by his bishop he's through at Emmanuel Church in Morecambe. And we didn't say anything about it because it was unfolding. Hopefully there was an appeal process. Mm-hmm. Hopefully there were ways he could undo this thing. Well, that two Sundays ago, the bishop you know, told Murphy he couldn't celebrate at this church, Manual Church in Morecambe, which is in the northwest of England. And they sent uh, another priest to read a letter to the congregation announcing that Brett had been terminated. Well, the congregation told this visiting priest they didn't want to hear the letter. They didn't want it. They wanted Brett back. This past Sunday, Bishop John Fenwick, the uh, primus of the Free Church of England and Bishop of the Northern Diocese, went to uh, uh, Emmanuel Church Morecambe, and they had a very disagreeable encounter. Uh, parts of this have been recorded and po- posted on social media, the exchange between the wardens and Bishop Fenwick. Bishop Fenwick told them they can't record the service. And 
you know, there were some extraordinary statements by uh, some people there uh, about calling the police and uh, being a threat and a danger. It was a thoroughly unchristian environment uh, with the bishop there. And uh, I think that you need to put the onus on the bishop for creating that environment. Now, why was Bishop, Bre why was uh, Brett fired? Well, essentially because he's too good at his job. The Church of England, uh, the Free Church of England has a habit of taking high profile, very successful, very good clergy who have come into their church for ideological reasons. They're broken with the Church of England and they wanted to come to a place that was faithful to the gospel. I'm talking about James Pace, Peter Sandlin, John Spragato, Calvin Robinson. Yeah. And they're all gotten rid of. And the, the, they're gotten rid of not by following the canons, not by following due process, basically by either being bullied out or forced out by John Finnick. And I think it's because they're successful. Uh, they are not beholden to the bishop in any way. They're a threat to the bishop. That's my opinion. I don't know that. But there's certainly nothing that any of these fellows have done. And in the wake of these dismissals, their congregations either leave en masse with them or collapse. And the assets are sold out from underneath the people. There have been a number of accusations of personal enrichment leveled against Bishop Fennec, which the police have investigated and any truth into it. The charity commissioners have looked at the handling of the Free mm -hmm. Church of England's money. No negative uh, or criminal proceedings have been issued, but it's just it's just an utter mess. Let's just take a snapshot of the Northern Diocese today, because I think it'll give you a sense sure. of what it's like. In Oswald Twistle, there's a one fellow, Tony Ford. There's a deacon with no training in Wolsey, a Matthew Firth, who's a new recent convert from the Church of England. Uh, he's starting a plant in New York. There's an Iranian refugee minister in Sheffield, but there's nobody in the Isle of Man. There's nobody in Blackburn. There's nobody at Toddington. Preston and Middlesbrough were both closed. And now Morecambe is going to be closed. This is a dying diocese. You would think that the Free Church of England would be flourishing in this time of utter collapse of the Church of England, but they're actually in worse shape than the yeah. Church of England structurally, administratively. It's interesting. You know, years ago, we would suggest people who are having trouble with the Church of England go to the Free Church of England. Uh, it's a healthy alternative. It's growing. Um, and you, you don't have to worry about the, the bad bishops were, that were controlling the Church of England at the time. Now we see that both are kind of collapsing at the same time. You know, the, the Church of England, as we reported over the last 10 years, is uh, imploding more and more each week. And to see this type of report come out of the Free Church of England, which was supposed to be a good and safe place to go, I'm, I, I'm bewildered. I am completely bewildered. I've met uh, John Fennec at an event with the REC uh, about 10 years ago. Pleasant person. So I, I, don't, I don't get this, George. Uh, this is not even the greatest blow-up. They, they had a Brazilian diocese, which was the majority of members of the Free Church of England. And they brought Joseph uh, Rossillo yep. over from Brazil to uh, basic. But Joseph is the most successful church planter in Anglicanism today, without a question. He's planted more churches in Brazil than uh, I don't know, number of churches yeah. in the diocese. And he was brought over, and within a short time, he withdrew from the Free Church of England, and the Brazilian diocese withdrew from the Free Church of England because of Bishop Fennec and its leadership. So this is a case of a good idea being effectively destroyed by a bad leader. Um, this will uh, no doubt engender critical comments on the uh, page and the threats. Yeah, and yeah absolutely. <laughs> but, it, but in my opinion, this is somebody, he's reached retirement age, go. Uh, go before the Free Church of England is completely dead. Otherwise, your legacy will be the destruction of a of, uh, historic institution. Now, here in the Episcopal Church and in the ACNA and most liturgical churches I'm familiar with, you can't just show up and fire a priest. There has to be some type of uh, process, a due process, uh, and an investigation, 
who said what, what's the charges. Um, is this something you can do in the Free Church of England where you can just show up and say, no, I don't like you, you fired? Or are the canons different? Well, the canons don't really allow these uh, unilateral and uh, slipshod actions by the bishop. Mm -hmm. But we now have to get down to the brass tacks uh, the, or the nitty gritty or whatever <laughs> cliche you wish to use. Sure, yeah. In the in the Episcopal Church, you know, Truro Parish, uh, uh, places like that that had money, uh, Christ Church in Savannah, they could hire lawyers to fight back and have years of litigation. Sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. You have dioceses that fought like Fort Worth, but because there was money to pay the lawyers. Um, that is not true in the Free Church of England. There's not a lot of cash floating around to retain legal counsel. And so the and they don't have contingency uh, payments in, in British law, in English law for lawyers. So the uh, money's not there to, in, to enforce the rights of the parishioners, of the clergy. And what money there is there is controlled by the uh, Primus and the trustees of the Free Church of England, who essentially are in his pocket, because if they're not, they're not no longer trustees, or they're, uh, well, they are what they are. Yeah. Well, I, this is your opportunity to uh, pray for and help support uh, Reverend Brett Murphy. Uh, he is not an Englishman. I did an interview with him, and he had an Australian accent. So I'm going to imagine that there's some bigger hoops to follow through here uh, to get unemployment or something for a person who's uh, not native to the UK. I would, as a recent viewer of news in the UK, suggest that he and his family leave the UK and come back by boat. Uh, apparently, there's going to be some more benefits uh, for you if you do something like that. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll put a link to uh, uh, any PayPal that uh, Brett has or any uh, other ways to contact or, or give some money to him. Uh, like I said in the beginning, this, I'm completely bewildered. It doesn't make sense um, other than the fact that when you look at how many new places there are for concerned clergy to go to in the Church of England, AMIE, uh, Europe, and other things, uh, it, it seemed to me like the last place that was recommended to go in the last year was the Free Church of England, and now I can understand why. But I don't. I have personal empathy for uh, yeah. Brett on this point, and that uh, his wife, who's pregnant, is the stress has caused her health problems. He's mm -hmm. a young family. Uh, he's youngish in the ministry. Thirty odd years ago, I had an equally bad bishop named Charles Benison in Pennsylvania. My wife was pregnant. Uh, with our children, she had, we had twins. And I went through a time of just absolute terror, but eventually I found my footing and uh, became a refugee in Florida <laughs> uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. God opened the right door and he closed the wrong door for me. And I don't know what life would have been like if I had stayed in Pennsylvania. Would I have gotten along to go along to get along? I, I don't know. Life yeah. would have been different. Uh, but out of this crisis, you know, God is going to use Brett to raise him to even greater things in, in the work of the kingdom. So this is not to say, oh, Brett, you should, you, you should uh, not worry. Of course you should worry. Absolutely. But by the same token, rejoice in the sufferings that are being heaped upon you because you're doing them in the name of Christ. You're doing the work of Christ. You're winning souls for Christ. And people are trying to attack you for doing that. Celebrate the fact that you're on the enemy's radar because you are going to be protected by the Lord once you get through all this crap. Right. And the greatest prayer that you want answered is, how can God be redeemed in this? And, uh, you know, I, I will try and, this week to... Pray for, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And I would say and pray for Bishop Fennec because right. it must be difficult being a man who self-identifies as a man of God who does ungodly things. Yeah, I don't know. Allegedly. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> Just like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, keep that situation in your prayers. And 
I, you know, you and I, this happens like once every six months. We'll wake up and we'll, we'll report on people who are on side, uh, so to speak. And what what's going on? How do they do that? And, you know, we're a broken world and we're broken people and we, we pray that they may all be healed. Second story, Blackburn Cathedral, we're back to UK, we're still talking about overseas here, had a safeguarding blow up. Archbishops, both uh, Welby and uh, Cartrell, apologized after the BBC reported that a canon at the cathedral named Andrew Hinley had been given £250,000 payout because he was fired incorrectly. And uh, this is a bigger story than that, George. This is a uh, awful story. The archbishops apologized for letting down the survivors. That's a quote from their letter. Here's the situation. Uh, Andrew Hindley, and I always think of the Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley. I don't know if there's <laughs> That's a, a reach. That's a reach. Uh, well, you know, it's uh, <laughs> not a common last name. No, okay. Okay. He's been a, on the staff of the cathedral as a priest, and there were accusations of misconduct raised against him, sexual abuse. He responded that this was homophobia and investigations were launched and they couldn't prove or do anything about it well it reached the point where julian henderson the bishop of blackburn and welby basically were discussing well what do we do to get rid of this guy because you know we can't have him around because he is to us a bona fide safeguarding risk so they basically retired him on health grounds well hindley sued for uh, wrongful dismissal and the cathedral settled for 240,000 pounds. However, a non-disclosure agreement was signed, so nobody knew about this until the BBC unearthed it and published this. And once this came out, it caused a furore because the alleged abuser is getting money from the Church of England while the victims are getting nothing. Now, here's the, here's the problem. Henderson said there has to be a way to get rid of clergy who are accused of bad things like this sexual abuse, not just wait for the legal system to grind through. And that may seem good on the surface, but there's a noted uh, commentator, former blogger named Adrian Hilton, who used to blog under the name Archbishop Cramner, yep. who's pointed out that uh, the problem with uh, following Henderson's advice are bad bishops bad bishops who will use the new canons and ha have trumped up safeguarding accusations leveled against clergy whom they don't like. Way to get rid of them. And suspend them without due process, without fairness, without adjudication. And they could partially do that now, but to go even further basically gives the bishop free reign to break uh, any clergyman or woman they don't like. So you have to find a rule that will enable you to get rid of real bad clergy that won't be abused by bad bishops. And unfortunately, the Church of England has both, bad clergy and bad bishops. Yeah. And we kind of had, you know, I don't remember the canon in the Episcopal Church that they always used, but there, there's Title IV and other things to, to use. Abandonment canon. Abandonment, Abandonment canon. canon. Yeah. That, uh, listen, and this they did this with the Connecticut Six. Uh, and this is years ago, this is 2006, 2004 to 2006 time period, where, listen, it, it, I, I'm sorry the Connecticut churches don't like that their bishop attended the consecration of Gene Robinson. Uh, you just have to live with it, because if you don't live with it, I'll accuse you of abandoning uh, your commitment to the diocese and the church, and you will be deposed. And, uh, and see, successful that canon, was that canon was used for people who had left the Episcopal Church and become Catholics yeah. that, and and were basically not working anymore. But under Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and people like Andrew Smith, that was twisted to mean you still want to keep your job, you're still working, yeah. but if you don't agree with the boss, you can be gotten rid of. They did this to Keith Ackerman. Yes, it is. He's the Bishop of Quincy. He's abandoned the community of the Episcopal Church. He said, no, I haven't. I'm still celebrating. I'm still uh -huh. following this and that. I just think you're wrong about uh, gay marriage and gay gay blessings. 
oh, well, if you don't agree with us, Catherine de Fritchori said, you've abandoned the communion of the Episcopal Church, which means me. Of course, that's an utter, utter uh, travesty of what the canons meant. But that will happen in the Church of England uh, if they put in new, uh, further uh, powers for the bishops to now, control just, the clergy. Back to our first story, and I don't know this because I'm certainly not a, a, a barrister in England by any fashion or means, um, but could those people who have been released by Fennec sue? Theoretically, right. but here's the thing. You need money to hire lawyers. Right. You know, the, the cases in Virginia and in diocese and other places lasted for years and oh, years yeah. and years. Yeah. Went up to the U.S. Supreme Court and back. Um, and the state Supreme Courts, because those parishes uh, had money. Uh, I don't see any of these fellows having hundreds of thousands of pounds to engage count, King's Councils to pursue the, church, the Free Church of England for wrongful dismissal or for violating the money's not there yeah. and the system is set up so that there's no independent tribunal or even independent HR department that says these are the rules we have to follow there's nothing there yeah. that's sad all right that every once in a while just because we need to, to have filler we have non stories and this next story is a non story uh, the Church of England is accused of dropping the world word world the Church of England is accused of dropping the word church in new church plants. The study called the New Things Study uh, found theological investigation into the work of starting new churches across 11 dioceses that they generally didn't use the word church anymore in their plants. This is a non-story, George. Yeah, this paper by a Durham uh, research center in found that about the 900 new churches planted in 10 dioceses, uh, 11 dioceses over the last 10 years, none of them use the word church or church plant. Now, this has been sort of, a lot of fuel has been poured onto this by some of the press outlets in England to say the Church of England is abandoning the word church and they've become totally woke. And no, it's not. Uh, this is just, you know, look at the ACNA, for goodness sakes. Uh, we've got so many loopy-doopy, hippy-dippy names for, you know, the fellowship by the river or, you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's just, so long as the gospel is preached, the sacraments celebrated, and uh, with Jesus Christ pro proclaimed, I don't care what you call yourself. Uh, not everybody, anybody has to be St. Peter's, St. Paul's, or Christ Church, the three <laughs> churches, the biggest names in the Episcopal <laughs> Church in the Church of England. Sure. Uh, you know, so what if you call yourself the happening or the groove to, you know. The groove. <laughs> in power, the virtual church, the V church. There's a lot of new church plants uh, that are happening in the evangelical world. And, you know, I look at the names and I scratch myself in the head and I go, I don't know why they chose it. But if they're able to glorify God and grow the church with a hippy dippy name, I'm okay with that as long as they do not uh, um, forge a new gospel. Well, look at your problem. diocese, C4SO. Yeah. A bishop's headquartered in Jackson, Tennessee, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, they would have been the Bishop of Jackson. It's a nice yeah. title. But yeah. instead, it's C four S O. It Christ sounds like for a defense the sake contract. Of yeah, yeah, it sounds like a defense contract yeah. or the Church of the Living Word. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a Pentecostal group. Yeah. But hey, you know, but the Church of the Living Word is doing wonderful things, yeah. Yeah. just as hey. a nippy yeah. nippy name. Yeah. So, yeah, I, the last thing I want to do on uh, Anglican scripted is come and complain about names. That that's silly. But uh, um, it is making the rounds on the internet. All right, next story. Stephen Knoll, a friend of Anglican Scripted, person we've interviewed many times, has a new book out called Millennial People, Boomer Priest. Uh, we yeah. just got it. We haven't read it yet. Got it in the mail. Uh -huh. uh, so, haven't read it yet. 
<laughs> uh, Terry Mattingly, friend of this show, on his syndicated column, mm -hmm. uh, did a little review of Steve Knoll. I'm repeating what I read in Terry Mattingly's column. Okay. Steve Knoll, who's well known to everybody, I think, who watches, uh, former professor at Trinity Seminary, former vice chancellor of Uganda Christian University, essentially the author of the Jerusalem Declaration, when you get down to it. He doesn't admit to it. Don't go, uh, you know, but okay. okay well, yeah, <laughs> he, he was the author. He uh, is in retired, and he spent a year uh, shepherding or uh, leading a. Uh, church plant in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. I don't know what it was called. Maybe it was called uh, some hippie dippy name we should complain about from the last story. But it's his experiences of being a millennial priest, uh, a boomer priest, mm -hmm. dealing with the millennial generation and how the rising generation experiences Christian life, Christian faith, Christian living, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. Haven't read the book. Terry Mattingly gave it a really positive review. And uh, Kevin, I'll send you a copy of the, uh, uh, the the cover, and maybe we can link it on Amazon if people want to look at it. Sure, uh, uh, buy it for themselves. Yeah, I've read I, I've read a recent book as well. Uh, I read a, a Megan Basham's new book called Shepherds for Sale, and I got to say, George, um, I've witnessed some of the stuff that happened in the AC and A, uh, in other places where people have. Um, slowly accepted a narrative that is not in scripture about sexuality or about politics or about COVID. And she goes here and she knows where all the dead bodies are laid. She, yeah, she names names. She talks about the, where the money's coming from. And I'm very impressed by this book as well. Uh, I read it in like a day and a half. It's, it's a quick read. And uh, she talks about evangelicals here in America who have been uh, selling their their shepherdship, so we see, speak. Get, get, and back up. I remember five years ago when I'm reading something on the, the Gospel Coalition website, and I go, we've lost the Gospel Coalition. They're no longer uh, on side. And I remember reading something about eight years ago on Christianity to Today, and I go, We've lost Christianity today. And I remember once watching a, a podcast with uh, 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 who sat back, uh, Rick Warren. And he was muddling his way through an answer. And I said, we've lost Rick Warren. And this lady, uh, Megan uh, Basham, goes through and talks about how we've lost these great evangelical characters of the last decade. And uh, it, it's an interesting reach. Not that we ever do book reports here, but, you know. Well, one way to look at it yeah. is I used to write for Christianity Today all the time. Sure. Then the new editor came on and uh, work dried up. I used to be a, a, on st correspondent for the Living Church magazine. Mm. Did that for nine years working for Steve Waring. New editor came on. Oof. Steve and I are both, yeah. both out the door. Yeah. Uh, it's not because we're bad writers but because yeah. editorial policies change with new editors and Living Church, and then and Christianity Today, Living Church, and other outlets uh, drank the Kool-Aid, wanted to be, wanted to be, how should I say that? They wanted to be viewed as prestigious by the culture. Yes. Rather than at being a voice for the gospel and they wanted to be a they wanted to be a christian and fit in i want the new york times to to admire me in my work i want the washington post to admire my work and i want to fit in as a a journalist and still be a christian and you can't you can't you you, you compromise and uh, megan goes through and shows all that yeah and you know steve waring and i would I understood he was my boss. Mm -hmm. Steve Waring would have these stories about political corruption, Episcopal corruption, and the Living Church. No, we don't want to do that anymore. We don't want to make enemies at eight fifteen. We, we want to be friends, and they wanted to be, you know, with yeah. they wanted to be kept in the tent and not, you know, outside the tent. And from what I've read, I've not read Megan Basham's book, but there have been some spirited. Uh, 
battles on Twitter and Facebook about it. Um, looks like the good the the here my our team yeah, is okay. defending her, <laughs> uh, and uh, the enemy is attacking her. Yeah, what does it tell you? All right, on to our next story. Uh, Jonathan Fletcher has appeared in court in Kingdom in Kingston upon the Thames upon Crown. Ten. Yeah, it, I can't Kingston that upon bad. Thames Crown Court. Little, little, yep. You can a week ago that. Monday, he pled guilty to uh, this, some uh, some of the charges. One charge uh, was not uh, brought forward. And we can't really comment on it because there's a cra- there's a crackdown, and we don't have on the comments under English law. You can't talk about cases underway, which uh, is very different in the United States. Think of the O.J. Simpson case, <laughs> uh, but uh, or Donald Trump's court cases. But because we don't have a correspondent in the courtroom, we're not really getting blow by blows. But once it all's over, we'll be able to go to great detail. Yeah. But the process, the, the legal criminal process against Jonathan Fletcher is unfolding as we speak. Yeah. Uh, last week, we, t- we gave you an update on Bernard Randall. Uh, we got a lot of uh, prompting and uh, op-ed comments since then. Let's talk a little bit about that, George. The, uh, this touched a nerve. Mm-hmm. This touched a nerve. The Bernard Randall story touched a nerve in English in the English consciousness, I'll say. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bernard Randall, of course, was the school chaplain who gave a sermon at Trent College, basically telling children to think for themselves and not just blindly follow any one agenda. For that, he was uh, disciplined by the headmaster, labeled a safeguarding risk, and his bishop, Libby Lane, violated Church of England safeguarding policies and threw him to the wolves and later blacklisted him, preventing him from getting another job. Uh, A report by King's Council found that Libby Lane acted unconscionably, irregularly, unlawfully, and that Justin Welby was approached by this King Council and on three separate occasions told, this is, the way you're handling this is wrong. You need to pursue action against Libby Lane for misconduct and Welby did nothing. So why is this resonating with the wider English world? So that we're seeing, uh, you know, this uh, you know, we're seeing articles calling for Welby to resign, and not just from George Conger calling for on Welby to resign. We're seeing it from un- unprecedented places. It ties into the narrative that there's a two-tier system in England for the favored and the unfavored. Uh, England, of course. Uh, is awash with uh, demonstrations and protests. And there is a pervasive sense that there's a two tiers uh, policing. On my Twitter feed, I'll see, you know, these stories where this judge released this Pakistani immigrant who was convicted of rape uh, with a caution because he didn't speak English. uh, And it's but sentenced a man who made an obscene, a rude gesture to a policeman to two years in prison that the native English are treated very differently than Muslim immigrants uh, by the court system, by the police, by the prime minister, by all the institutions. And the Church of England has a two-tiered system of justice. It had, you know, those who are woke and favored uh, can say and do almost anything. Um, But if you are faithful to the gospel, uh, you get thrown to the wolves. Mm -hmm. And so the the hypocrisy of the leadership, the basically unfairness of the leadership, this Bernard Randall case really has touched a chord uh, because it it's the same chord that the average English man and woman is feeling right now about their country being taken away from them. Now their church is, and their church has been taken away from them. Mm-hmm. Last week, I mentioned a uh, Islamic student who had raped a 13-year-old had been released because he said he did not know it was wrong. And his name is Sean Hogg. And he said, listen, I go to an, his, his defense after being accused of uh, um, raping a 13-year-old was, I go to an Islamic school here in England, 
and they teach that women aren't worth anything and that they're basically property and that you can rape them. And if you do rape them, it's their fault. This is his defense. Uh, the judge agreed. Listen, okay, uh, I hear what you're saying. You know, you go to a school where they teach that uh, women are property and they have of no value and, and you can rape them. Uh, we're not going to punish you like we would a normal rapist. And you're, you're off with time served. Should the response of the church in England be, oh my gosh, this guy got off for uh, raping a 13-year-old because he used the defense that I go to a bad school? Or should the defense go, oh my gosh, there's bad schools in England that are teaching this stuff and we should stop them? They aren't. Nobody said anything about the school. Nobody said anything about uh, what they teach there and how they, these Islamic schools that are all over uh, England are teaching that women are, are worthless and they are property and they can be raped and if they are raped, it's their fault. Instead, we find a Christian uh, chaplain who preaches a Christian sermon and says, you need to think for yourself, don't just believe what the state tells you, and we come down on him. George, that, that's, that's the greatest instance of hypocrisy you could show in a nation. And, mm. you know, right here, you know, our hero, uh, Brandon Russell, is in the middle of it. So, I don't know. It, if I may, I'm going to go a little bit sideways on this. Okay. For those who are active on Twitter and social media, you'll see tweets and posts by Candace Owens, who's an American, African-American woman who's a conservative commentator. Mm -hmm. But basically, she's been tweeting out this uh, alleged quotes from the Talmud that basically uh, say that Jews can do terrible things to non-Jews, that rape of a non-Jew is, is not wrong, that all oh, this and that and the other. All of those are lies. Yes. Candace Owen, Candace Owen has bought into the anti-Semitic Kool-Aid and has just gone round the bend with her, uh, you know, I'm not saying she's reposting the elders of the Protocols of Zion, but she's reposting some of the historic falsehoods yes. about Jews. Yes. And I don't know whether it's coincidental that it's arising just as the crimes of Muslims against non-Muslims are being profiled, but we've got somebody who is basically saying, well, look, they're not just bad. Look at the Jews. They're even worse. And the things that she's putting out are lies. Don't believe her. Mm -hmm. uh, she's either deluded or she's got an evil mind. I unfriended her on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah, and but you, at some point you have to believe a bigger lie when you when you're going after something like that. Is Judaism perfect? No, <laughs> no. Are, are people in Israel perfect? No. Uh, we've talked about many times that there there is an idealistic racism in the culture, no question about it. Can Arabs freely live within Israel? Oh my goodness, yes. Do they thrive and survive and operate businesses? Yes, they do. Are they allowed to vote? Yes, they do. And so we're... Can they, do they serve in the army? <laughs> uh, do, are they first uh, of the parliament or the Knesset? Are, <laughs> You know, yeah. there's even there's even Arab Israeli members okay. of the diplomatic corps who are ambassadors to foreign yeah. countries. So there is a lie trying to exist within another lie, and uh, I see the difficulty here um, because uh, if Israel thinks that it's perfect and doing all the right things all the time, it's clearly not. Um, is it a victim of the times? It's becoming that way because. No matter how, how you identify doing the right thing, nobody will believe you. And that, that's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. All right, George, we got how many more stories here? We uh, got three more stories. Three more stories. Let's do Lambeth Palace response to the Bangladesh, Bangladesh crisis. We talked about this last week that, uh, you know, all hell is breaking out in Bangladesh. Bangladesh wanted. Lambeth to respond to it. And what did they say, George? I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Yeah. Uh, 
Lambeth Palace got back to me saying they just don't know what to believe about what's happening in Bangladesh because the BBC has reported that there are right-wing false news stories going around saying that Muslims are persecuting Hindus. Well, I have no doubt that there are yeah. bad actors on every thing, but the, but the Lambeth Palace is holding fire because the BBC is saying, well, maybe it's not as bad it's being, as it's being portrayed. Now, perhaps that's a wise move, but on the other hand, they have the testimony of the primate of Bangladesh, and they're not listening to that. Instead, if I could read minds, which is wrong, they seem to be more concerned about not offending Muslim sensibilities in the UK than calling out Muslim atrocities in Bangladesh, because they don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. How? I'm going to help myself out here. I know a website and a uh, YouTube uh, podcast where you could find out truth, things that are correct and have stories corrected, and that's Anglican Unscripted. I'm patting myself here. And Anglican.inc. I would recommend that to both the archbishops and the people at Lambeth. I, and I know people at Church House have to watch this show because you're paid to and you have to, to, to find out what's ha happening in the news. But a lot of what we talk about is absolutely true, George. Like the next story. Did I ever tell you what my, my second job was out of college? I was a disc jockey. Not because I have a thundering, booming voice, but because I could play the right music to make people happy. And I had the greatest music in the 80s to choose from, George. I had Prince, I had Madonna, I had uh, Bowie, uh, just great dance tunes. And, and so, all the while you had a flock of seagulls haircut. I had my flock of seagulls down. haircut and, you know, just yeah. boom in the mic. Yeah, just, just, uh, just I loved what I did. Loved entertaining people. Canterbury Cathedral has found that to be as fun as well. From the website, Dance Hits with Kylie, Father McNoll, Madonna, Prince, and many others of the 80s in a magnificent illuminated nave of Canterbury Cathedral. Get your tickets now. Yeah, in February they had a 90s night and last Friday night they had an 80s night at the cathedral. Uh, and the same complaints, the same observations that we raised then I think we'll raise today. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is appropriate. Uh, Yes, I'm sure that they would have medieval mystery plays in cathedrals because, you know, yes, you could probably come up with some pseudo-historical argument, but a cathedral is a place to worship the Lord. Yeah. It is a place to to contemplate and to know and to get in touch with him. And it's and that's the way it's designed. And to turn it into a eighties disco night, you know. Just do it across the street in the parish hall, or do it in uh, do it rent a school auditorium or a gym. You don't need to do it in the cathedral, Kevin. Unless why you want money? Yeah, Kevin. Why aren't you a disc jockey anymore? Well, I'm not a disc jockey anymore because the lyrics changed. Okay, and rap was uh, introduced heavily into the in the music scene in the in the eighties and nineties, and. When the lyrics changed, it became so profane, I, I couldn't do that anymore as a Christian perf to be a disc jockey uh, performing. I remember the, the song that did it for me was called Sex It Up or Sex You Up, uh, something in, 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 that was playing in the early 90s. And I was playing at a middle school dance, and these girls were uh, dancing and doing horrible dances to it. And I said, that's it, done. Now I sold my company and made a lot of money, but um, I can't see how 90s music was bad enough. Are they gonna have rap night at the cathedral? Are they gonna, you know? Next, I don't know. Uh, ne ne this fall, I'm sure we'll have 70s night, then 70s. 60s night, and 50s night. Ooh, going down, 1850s is where we stopped, George. That's when the good hymns were uh, out. The, All right. The, the Spectator magazine has called for the Dean David Monteith to step down. Yeah. And Monteith has done gay blessings in the cathedral, dance parties, 
And remember last Lent, he advertised a deluxe retreat with over a thousand pounds a person, you know, with gourmet food and wine at the cathedral. Hmm? Uh, if this fellow was a member of the Chamber of Commerce trying to get business, that's a great thing. But as yeah. dean of the cathedral, that's supposedly the uh, home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. No, I don't think so. Uh, not a good, not a, not a good look. Nope. All right, George, let's move on to trajectory. Uh, we're talking about the Anglican Church of Canada. Um, Living Church recently uh, posted a uh, magazine article about them and how they are essentially done. Now, we knew about maybe eight, nine, or ten years ago they were done because they stopped publishing their numbers. Uh, you know, we always get the Episcopal Church faithfully publish their numbers and they're in decline. Uh, ACNA publishes their numbers, they're faithfully growing. And we watch the numbers because that's a little bit of an indicator of how your church is doing and how culture is accepting your church. The church in Canada has been decimated by numbers and as revealed in the Living Church article. But we already knew that, George. This isn't something new. It's something new for the Living Church. Uh, I'll give away my age by saying when I was a uh, preteen, it was a big treat to be able to stay up and watch this new show called Saturday Night Live. Uh, and Chevy Chase would have this recurring joke, which was Francisco Franco is dead. still dead. Yeah, dead. The yeah. dictator of Spain, uh, his reports of his death uh, were back and forth, and and uh, Chevy mm. Chase turned it and he's still dead. The Anglican Church of Canada is still dead. We've been reporting on this for many, many years, and there's a new article that basically is saying nothing new just uh, drawing conclusions that we've already drawn, which is that it's, you know, it's end point is coming. Now, the church is dying. And in some parts of Canada, the Anglican Network in Canada, ANIC or ANIC, is now larger than the Anglican Church of Canada. We know this to be true in Western Canada. In the Vancouver, Vancouver area. yeah, yeah. But even conservative dioceses in the Anglican Church of Canada are having a hard time. Uh, Fredericton, which is the province of New Brunswick, uh, the Arctic, um, they're having trouble. And as are other denominations, the Catholic Church, the uh, United Church was the Presbyterians and others joined together. Canada is becoming faster under Trudeau, or maybe has nothing to do with Trudeau. Its secularization is growing more rapidly and rapidly each year. It's more European than American in its worldview. And it's very hard, uh, harsh soil for evangelism. It's a difficult spot to proclaim the gospel. So the death of the Anglican Church of Canada is partially natural. It's been accelerated by the uh, decisions and the doctrines made by the Ang decisions on doctrine made by the Anglican Church of Canada but man, the, the people in Anak have a tough job for, ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, because they're working. They really are being countercultural by being Christian in Canada. Canada itself is its own problem, and one of the, I, the Church of Canada ran up against a couple of things. One, culture. Two, I think they were highly invested in rural areas more than city areas uh, in the other part of the church. So when farmland and rural areas evacuated and the people moved back, moved back to the city, um, that hurt the church. But the church in Canada has nothing outside of culture to offer culture. There's mm -hmm. nothing different than that we offer. Yes, we can offer you some hymns and singing and stuff like that, but basically we don't teach anything different than what culture is teaching you. We don't have any hope that we can offer you as uh, Christians because we don't believe in that hope. And culture catches on to that really quickly because we know in places all around the world, China, Russia, um, North Korea, where there is hope, even persecuted, the church grows. And um, I would hope that that would one day take hold in Canada. I don't know if the persecution has to get worse, but that may be something that has to happen. I don't know. One of the things that always sort of struck me as funny, and it is that when I read articles in England, 
some of the English uh, religious publications will talk about a Christian public Christian uh, politician, and as if this is like something noteworthy. You know, here in my little county, uh, next to Kevin's little county, we have the the candidates for sheriff all come to visit each of the churches in the run up to the election to shake hands. Mm -hmm. We had a forum where all the co candidates for election to county commissioner or Congress and all this and that come and talk to the people, open forums. And when they talk about themselves, one of the things everybody says, well, I turn attend XYZ church. The thought that a politician should be singled out for being Christian would be is considered ludicrous because it's just assumed. But it would be considered ludicrous, I think, in Canada for a politician or in England for a politician to say, I attend XYZ church when discussing themselves. It just, I guess, where I am is still what we would call Christendom, where there's just this assumption that if you're not Jewish, you're Christian. Yeah. I remember going to school in the, in the 60s, or 60s, 70s, and 80s. Every one of my friends went to a church on Sunday. And mm -hmm. some limitedly went to uh, youth events at their church throughout the week. I, I can't think of any of my friend group that didn't go to church. Now amongst my kids' friends, none of them go to church. Uh, we were introducing uh, my children's friends to Bibles for the time. Oh, we don't have a Bible in our house. Here, have <laughs> a Bible. And that was just 20, 20, 25 years later that we've gone to a point where everybody would take their family to a church, uh, either you know just through mu muscle memory or because they actually believed, to church is no longer a part of culture in American uh, culture in the Northeast or the Midwest. You know, I, I, I can't speak so much of uh, Florida because all my neighbors in Florida go to church, George. Yeah. And the uh, work ahead, and that it's why I don't really want to beat up the Church of England for not using the word church. If it's going to cause people not to come, yeah. then don't use it. Uh, here, uh, my dressing this way, our having a sign and a uh, steeple, we get walk-in traffic uh, simply because of the outward appearances of the church, uh, of traditional Christianity. And ho hopefully people stay because the message they receive is life-changing and affirming. Um, but it's, we're more like Africa, uh, yeah. where I am. Uh, and, uh, and this in parts of the United States the United States is close to Africa and its religiosity, and it is certainly to Canada or to Europe. Um, and it's not really been changing. One of the things that, uh, you know, the latest uh, Barna uh, reports show that the rising generation uh, is really split into very, they're going into traditional wor worship or they're going out into the void. And give a little Steve Steve Nola plug. That's what he's finding. Yeah. He's finding people who love the Anglican way, but couldn't care less about the Episcopal Church ACNA fight. You know that for them could be as much as the uh, uh, I don't know Albigensian heresy of you know, <laughs> the fourth century it means nothing to them. Yeah. But they're we're seeing young people such that you're able to support and grow churches in in parts of the United States, even in suburban Pittsburgh and the Rust Belt, seeking Jesus Christ and seeking to worship him in a liturgical fashion, fashioned by the prayer book. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not bad news. It's just we are at a time of great change. And I just am lucky, I guess, in my profession to be in a place where it's still 1955 in the culture. In the culture. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what happens in the future. But, you know, uh, I think always keeping the focus uh, on Jesus, it, keeping the main thing the main thing. Little, yeah, go ahead. Here's a little. The people in this congregation call this room I'm in right now my study. Mm -hmm. Most churches. Most of my friends up north have offices. Yeah. 
where they administer the church. The mindset is, this is my study where I read the scriptures and study and prepare for worship. And that, I know it's a small thing, but that worldview is so very different from an office where I manage to a study where I prepare to, uh, to, to share the word. Maybe I'm making more of it than it is, but... Uh, this is unscripted. We don't make more of anything that isn't, George. All right. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 876 of Anglican Unscripted. Thank you.